Would you please open your Bibles to the New Testament, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and as our custom has been, as we continue to study the word of reconciliation, we will read this as our text again. Beginning in verse 17, <clears throat> Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. The book of conversions, the book of Acts of Apostles, gives a partial history of the work of the ambassadors for Christ, as well as other inspired teachers, as they presented the word of reconciliation. And that covers a period of some 30 years when you read throughout the book that Luke recorded, My Inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The accounts of conversions during this particular time are not alike fully, some being abridged statements, and that needs to be understood. As stated in a previous sermon on this general topic, fairness requires that these abridged accounts should be interpreted in the light of the full accounts and not the other way around, the full accounts in the light of the abridged. It is another way of saying take all of what the Bible says on a given subject before you begin to reason with it to determine what ought to be or ought not be based upon the totality of the information that inspiration has given us. We're actually talking about a rule of rightly dividing or handling aright the word of truth, which we must, as we study the scriptures, to show ourselves approved unto God, 2 Timothy 2.15. So we may very well say that a correct rule of interpretation is that where a condition of salvation, a condition of salvation, is clearly expressed in one particular case of conversion, then it must be understood in all other cases of conversion, whether it is expressed or not. Salvation in no case, in no case must be predicated on fewer conditions than are found in any given case. And as we emphasize this, you have to think, why did the Holy Spirit have Luke put these specific ones down there? And that means that since it is a letter written to Theophilus to take up where he left off in the Gospel of Luke written to the same person, then he knows that these things must be, that is, putting all of it together to understand the whole. So as all cases are not reported alike in full, Salvation then may be predicated upon a greater number of conditions than are expressed in a particular case, but nevertheless, again, that's a way of saying, take all of what the New Testament says, in this case concerning conversion to Christ, put it together and reason with it. You wouldn't want to say, well, I think I'll select this case of conversion and neglect all the others and just follow that way of being converted to Christ. That just doesn't make sense when the whole volume is there to learn from. Now the eight cases of conversion that are given the most detailed study by Luke are those on the day the church started. We would call them maybe the Pentecostians, Acts chapter 2. Then as you'll remember, we studied the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. The eunuch in Acts 8. Then Saul of Tarsus in Acts 9, Cornelius in Acts 10 in a repetition of that conversion in Acts 11, Lydia in Acts 16, and the Philippian jailer in Acts 16 
And finally, the conversion of those in Corinth in Acts 18. Now, six of these have been fully examined in previous sermons. A Saul of Tarsus, after having given giving a, a history of what he did in persecuting the Lord's church, of how vehement and zealous he was to oppose God, thinking he was right. Of his journey then to Damascus, of the amazing vision that he saw of the resurrected Christ, and the direction of Christ to go into the city and there would be somebody there to tell him what he must do to be saved. And then when that preacher Ananias, directed by the Lord to go to Saul of Tarsus, found him, he found him a repentant and prayerful person. And upon finding this man who believed in Christ, repented of his sins and confessed his faith in Christ, realizing his situation, he simply says, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, 16. I might emphasize here that calling on the name of the Lord in this same verse means that when you are baptized according to the teaching of the New Testament, you are appealing to the authority of Jesus Christ to save you. And that compares perfectly to Acts 2 and verse 38 where believers were told to repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. We find there are three accounts in the book of Acts of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. In Acts 9, it is said after having received the direction of the gospel preacher in uh, Acts 22, 16, that it says of Paul, he arose and was baptized. Well, what kind of person arose and was baptized? He was a believer in Christ. He was one who repented of his sins. He was one who readily by his very actions implies he confessed Christ to be his Savior. Now a year after Paul's imprisonment that we studied last week in the city of Philippi, in his journeyings you find that he comes to Achaia, Greece. You find that he comes to Corinth, the city there. And the scripture says that he continued a year and six months teaching the word of God. It is also said that he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Now he did this because the scripture also says as he preached the gospel to them. And that tells us then that the gospel is a reasonable message. It's not strictly emotions. But you appeal to the intellectual, rational part of man that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. And so the scripture says as an apostle, he testified that Jesus was Christ. Now, you'll remember that as he defends his apostleship to the Corinthians in the second letter that he wrote them that we have in the New Testament, that one of the things that he said that proved he was an apostle, an ambassador of the court of heaven, is in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. Where he said, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. And he mentions the miracles and the wonders. So when it says that he testified that Jesus was the Christ, how was he to be known as a credible witness? It's because he could work miracles that no normal human being could work. And he worked them by the power of the Holy Spirit, confirming the word that he preached. Yet the word that he preached was proof that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was a son of God. Now the result of all this, and it's related by the inspired Luke 2, was in the city of Corinth, many Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Now as this closes actually this part of our study on the word reconciliation, in the examination of the cases of conversion I mentioned, which is under the ministry of the ambassadors of Christ who had the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. We studied that also more fully one Sunday afternoon and talking about the parakletos or 
to anglicize it, paraclete relationship the Holy Spirit had with the apostles, we see that that relationship that the Holy Spirit had with them was like the Lord himself had with them while he was with them. Only he was in the flesh. And we're able to see that the Holy Spirit could be with them through no matter what because he wasn't flesh. Yet he would supply to them what the Lord supplied to them while he was with them to enable them miraculously to do what the Lord called them to do. And fundamentally, that was to reveal the whole New Testament. The church understood that for on the day the church started in Jerusalem. The scripture says of those that were obedient to the gospel and being baptized into Christ, that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And there had to be a reason that those people would continue in the apostles' doctrine. And it was because they had received the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. And thus the Holy Spirit was revealing the will of Christ to the apostles. So there was a time when inspiration was in man. But that's all been now committed to writing. Somebody said, I'd like to see a miracle. I'll read you one any day. And it's incontrovertible. I have no doubt that the miracles the Christ did and the miracles the apostle did cannot be set aside, cannot be successfully set apart. Now, if they were done 2,000 years ago in reality, uh, they're still just as done now as they were then. You can't say because something happened 2,000 years ago because of its age that therefore it's so old it didn't happen. You know... We could kind of try that on some of us. I'm so old, that didn't happen. Now, how much sense would that make? But that's what some people do, that the New Testament is so old, it couldn't have happened. Well, if things are verified and proven 2,000 years ago, aren't they still verified and proven today? And that's something a lot of folks just don't stop and think about. Because they think that, well, it's got to be proven to me and everybody else over and over and over again. But once the thing is confirmed, once the thing is proven, it is proven forevermore. Thus, we can today affirm that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God. And how am I going to prove that? I'm going to rely upon what transpired 2,000 years ago. A lot of people think, well, that's just too old. Well, why? I question again those who think that way. Why does age make any difference at all? when it comes to proving anything. Now I want to do this to remind you of how things work in going through the book of Acts and you see fully why we call it book of conversions because there are cases of non-conversions and there are always the situation where the word was preached but they did not abide by it. But in the case of conversions, here's what we have. I mentioned those on Pentecost when the church was established, the Pentecostians in Acts 2. If you look at that, you'll see there was preaching of the gospel. There was faith formed in them by the reception of the truth that's contained in the gospel that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. You find that as believers, they cried out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And as believers in Christ, he told them you need to repent and to be baptized, Acts 2.38. Now that's the first account. The second account we studied was the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. If you look at that account, you'll see there was the preaching of the gospel. There was faith formed in those that accepted the truth preached. There's no mention of repentance in that case. Yet they are, it is mentioned that they were baptized. When you come on over to Acts 8, Philip the preacher, he's preaching the gospel. Faith is produced by, in the eunuch by the reception of the truth that was preached. No mention of repentance there, but there is then a mention of baptism. When you come to the account of Saul of Tarsus, as I mentioned, in Acts chapter 9, that's the first account of it in the book. I say there are three. This is the first. There was the preaching of the gospel. There's no mention of faith there in Paul. There's no mention of repentance in him. But there is the mention of baptism. And that's as much as you've got in the Great Commission that Mark records of Jesus saying, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Then you have the conversion of of the first uncircumcised Gentile, Cornelius and his household in Acts chapter 10. What do you have in that one? You have the preaching of the gospel. You have faith by that preaching being received because it's the evidence that Christ is a son of God. You have also now a mention of repentance. And then you have a mention of baptism. 
When you come to Philippi and the conversion of Lydia, in Acts 16, you have the preaching of the gospel. You don't have any mention of faith in particular or repentance, but you do have baptism. Then you see the, you, uh, rather the jailer who was converted in Acts 16, and there was the preaching of the gospel to him. It's mentioned that faith was formed in him, but there's no mention of repentance, but baptism is mentioned. And then we come down to what I've already mentioned, these specific cases where much attention is given to them, to the Corinthians in Acts 18, and there is recorded by Luke the preaching of the gospel. There's faith produced in the Corinthians, no mention of repentance, but there is baptism. Now, out of all of those eight cases, you have preaching mentioned every time. You have baptism mentioned every time. You have faith mentioned some six times and repentance twice. Now you put them all together. Is it difficult? Is it really difficult taking the totality of the information on people becoming Christians under the direction of the Holy Spirit through the apostles? Is it, is it difficult to see that one must hear the gospel of Christ? The hearing meaning you understand the message and make proper application to your life. That they had faith formed in them, Romans 10, 17. Trust and confidence in Christ and the things of Christ as the Savior. That they repented of their sins, Acts 2, 38. Turned from a life of living contrary to God's will to a life of desiring only to do the Lord's bidding. And then they were baptized for unto, in order to a given end, and that is the remission or the forgiveness of their sins. I don't mean to be haughty or whatever, but folks, that's the way it's right and can't be wrong. That is the totality of the message. That's the Lord's will to the one who's not a Christian in order to understand what one must do in order to become a Christian. You can develop every one of these points. The preaching, what all can be said about the gospel. You can develop all that's said about faith the noun form of what belief is the verb form. And you can talk a lot about what that means. And the same thing with repentance and baptism. But nevertheless, those are the requirements of the Lord for one to become a Christian. No more, no less. He doesn't require more than that to become a Christian. Less than that, you cannot become a Christian. So in these eight cases of conversion, preaching is expressly mentioned in every case. I reiterate this. And then you see baptism in every case. Faith all but in two and repentance in only two. Where absent in name, faith and repentance are implied by the Scriptures. Let me mention quickly, we must infer from the Scriptures only what the Scriptures imply. Sometimes I hear people get their terms mixed up and they say, well, the Scriptures infer this. No, we do the inferring. The Scriptures do the implying. Our problem and our responsibility and our obligation is to infer only what the Scriptures imply. Now, if you say, well, that's, that's a whole lot of gobbledygook. No, it's not. It's just simply setting out how the mind works when you conclude anything. Let me show you. When you came, most of you, if not all of us, to the church building today, I'm assuming that you drove a vehicle. I'm assuming that somewhere along that line you may have come to a traffic light. Most of you did anyway. Now, if it was green facing you, as I'm facing those doors back there to the vestibule, that implied to you something about the color of that light facing the other directions. And you had such faith in it, you placed your life in the hands of that life as you went through. Hoping that it said red toward those folks and they stopped. Now we're not talking about people who jump the gun on those things. Or who drive through green after it's turned yellow and all into red. We're talking about the way it's supposed to work. And that's just the way it works when it comes to implication. When I see green facing me, all other things being equal in traffic controlled by what they're meant to do, then what do I know is facing the other folks who have a right to go through that intersection just like I do? Stop! 
And that's how simple it is. So when I see green, I can infer that the other side is saying red. You do it in everything you do. Every phase of your life, you do that. So why, when it comes to the Scriptures, God communicating in us, writing on our level of understanding, the most important thing we ever need, how to escape hell and go to heaven, do I not use the mind God gave me? Take all the Bible said in the matter in its proper context and draw the conclusion. Because that conclusion, folks, has to do with whether you're going to go to heaven or hell. It's that simple. But it's that powerful and that important. Now, I think a few observations are in place maybe just here before we end the lesson. In all recorded work of the apostles, notwithstanding there were thousands of persons converted, the question, what must I do to be saved? Or its equivalent, what must we do? Occurs, but only three times. Now, let me pause here and say, if you, if you determine what is important in the Bible, are more important than something else, by how many times it's found you're following a wrong rule. The Lord doesn't have to say anything more than once for it to be binding. I would say if you find it mentioned twice or three times or ten times, you better really pay attention to it. Because all he has to do is say one time, to Noah, make me an ark, of gopher wood. How many times do you have to say that before he meant wood and gopher? One time. So do not follow that false rule of interpreting the scriptures that the more times it's mentioned, the more important it is. So if it's mentioned once, it's really not that important. That won't work. No doubt the question that we read here, though mentioned only three times, was propounded countless times throughout the 30 years that we have recorded in the book of Acts. But that raises the question, and I've partially touched on it, why are there only three inspired records? First of all, the writer of Acts, Luke, did not, and you must understand this about a book, did not propose to give a full account of all of the apostles' work. I've asked before, how many apostles do you really study about in the book of Acts? And you really study about uh, James who was killed, Peter and John, and Paul. And that's it. But you know there were more than that. Now what were all these apostles doing? Exactly what Peter, John, and Paul were doing. They did the work of an apostle. We've labored to point that out in this whole series on the ambassadors of the court of heaven. Wherever they were, they were doing what Jesus chose them to do that was the responsibility peculiar to the office of the apostles. So Luke didn't propose to give a full account of the apostles' work, but only a sufficient amount to furnish proper instruction for the teachers and the learners of God's infallible word in the ages to come till the end of the world. Compliance then with the word of reconciliation brings one into the kingdom and fellowship of Jesus Christ. There are but three possible conditions for one to be in outside of the kingdom. I say outside of the kingdom. One may be simply an unbeliever. A believer who has done nothing more than believe. Or a believer who has repented of his sins but has not been baptized. Now there, there are no more conditions for a person to be in outside of the kingdom of Christ. These three states are represented by the questioners in the three cases that are recorded. Isn't that interesting? That ought to tell us something about the Holy Spirit and His infinite wisdom being God working upon the inspired writer Luke. It is sufficient for what God meant to do with it. The jailer in Acts 16 is representative of the unbelieving class. He was a pagan. Know anything about the Jews or their background? He may have known there were such a thing as Jews. We knew nothing about them. Didn't know anything about the Old Testament scriptures. 
So that's one class of believers, unbelievers, I should say. Then the second class are the Pentecostians, Acts 2. These are folks who were Jews and had knowledge of the Old Testament. They had a lot of misconceptions of it. But they had that which the Paul said was a schoolmaster to bring them unto Christ. They might be justified of faith. So there's one class of them. And yet Saul of Tarsus, who had become the great apostle Paul, represents those who have believed and repented. Now it doesn't explicitly say in just so many words that Saul of Tarsus in the process of becoming a Christian repented. But since a person cannot become a Christian without repenting, and Saul became a Christian, he had to repent. So everybody outside of Christ, lost in their sins, alien sinners, fall into one of those three classes. And there's a question in the book of Acts covering each one of them. Brethren, do you not see the marvelous wisdom of God in furnish us completely unto every good work? So as every possible condition is represented in these records, to have added more would have been, well, let's use the words that are said by Job. To darken counsel with a multiplicity of words. Sometimes we may not realize that's important too. Why do we not need to follow the conciseness and the direction of the greatest book on earth in conveying the message of salvation and our teaching and our preaching? Now, conversion is a process. And it's not necessarily instantaneous. The reason that we show steps in salvation, one, two, three, four, five, is so that it can be set out consistently. The same is true of our worship. There are five acts of worship. Does that lessen the importance of each act or the necessity of studying what the Bible says about it concerning our attitude and our participation in it? Why, when we teach anything that involves component parts, we've got to designate it some way. And remember that a whole always has component parts. Always does. And you might find it being called constituent elements, but nevertheless, if we that way you want to refer to it, if you have an internal combustion engine, that's one internal combustion engine. Uh, are there many parts in it? And everyone's necessary. So to study the whole, we break it down to its parts. And in studying the parts, we understand the interrelation. And we understand the whole when we do that. Well, that's what's meant when we approach even the study of the Scriptures. To systematically study the Scriptures means that we must have a way, because God made our brains to work systematically. And when you're trying to be a teacher, then you want to impart that knowledge so the brain can best use itself as God intended and that's pretty well a logical approach to things. So conversion is a process on your part and mine, anybody else's. It's not instantaneous. And so when we talk about you must hear the gospel, you must believe in Christ, you must repent of your sins, you must confess your faith in Christ, then you're qualified to be baptized for the remission of sins. That doesn't remove that this may have taken quite a bit of time between hearing and believing or believing and repenting. Or repenting and a willingness to stand up boldly, especially in the Islamic nation, and confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So simply because they're enumerated does not mean that it's being taken, anything's being taken away from the seriousness and the importance of the whole that is seen in the whole plan of salvation by breaking it down to its component parts. It's for instructional purposes. So the purpose of conversion is to bring men back to God. It's the word of reconciliation. What is? The gospel of Christ. What's that? Where God located his power to save us. Romans 1, 16. It's interesting, too, that you mentioned the Corinthians, or Luke does in Acts 18. But we can see more of what happened to them in converting them to Christ by reading the first Corinthian epistle where Paul is correcting their views, uh, erroneous views, of course, on the resurrection. Read the first four verses of 1 Corinthians 15. 
And he says, here's what I preach to you. You don't find that in the book of Acts. You find it in the letter written to them and their peculiar needs. And Paul in so writing has to refer back and say, what did you hear from me that made you a Christian? And he tells him 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And that connects directly in with the conversion account of the Corinthians in Acts 18. So the purpose of conversion is to bring men back to God in every respect that he is away from God. If I come upon a person who's already a proper believer in Christ, why should I try to convert him to belief? I want to take a believer. Now I want to get him to take the next step. Man, listen, is separated from God in the condition of his heart, his inward man. That is, his emotions, his intellect, his will, and his conscience. He is separated from God in the very manner of his life. And he is separated from God in his relationship. Now, look at this. In faith is confidence and trust in God and Christ through the teaching of the scriptures by the evidence contained therein. The heart turns to God. In repentance, we are able to see the life is adjusted radically from turning away from the way it pleases you turning to the way it pleases the Lord as He manifests His will and His Word. And it is through baptism that we enter the church of the living God. And what we see is, is that one step actually prepares the way for another. It may not happen overnight. You know, sometimes you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that certain people believed, but they wouldn't confess Him for fear of being put out of synagogues. Well, let's suppose 10 years goes by. And they finally have enough growth and development to where that belief they had 10 years before led to the repentance, confession of faith, and baptism. Would they had to 10 years later be persuaded again what they were already persuaded about Christ? Not so. They're still believers. Folks, there's a host of folks in the world today who are believers in Christ, and they're just as lost as lost they ever be lost because they haven't repented and confessed their faith and been baptized to Christ. So a purified heart prepares the way for a purified life. And a purified heart and life prepares the way for citizenship in the kingdom of Almighty God. I'd like to use this one figure that may help illustrate this as I close the lesson. And we'll simply look at the naturalization process of a person from another country, born into that country. Thus, he became a citizen of that country because of birth. In conversion, one loses citizenship in one kingdom, and that would be the world, in a state of sin. But he gains it in another, and that's the kingdom of God. Paul put it this way to the Colossians, reminding them of what they did in becoming Christians. And here's what he wrote. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Colossians 1.13. In the change of citizenship, they are then, for sake of understanding and instruction, there are then certain necessary steps. To become a citizen of our government, the foreigner... Common sense says, must hear this country and have a desire to be a part of it. He must believe in it strongly enough to be willing to leave his own country. Now you think about what it would take to get you to leave this country, become a citizen of another country, and you'll appreciate that some. And, of course, that means to come to this one too. Well, coming here, and we're talking about legally, folks. Coming here, he must file his application, however all that's involved in the red tape to become a citizen. He must remain a certain prescribed number of years, if my memory serves me correctly. And then before proper officers of the government, subscribe with an oath of allegiance to this country. <coughs> this done, and not before he becomes a citizen. With all the obligations, 
rights and privileges that we all have, even though we were born into it. The similarity between this and becoming a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, I think, is apparent. One must hear of Christ, must believe in him, and must become sufficiently tired of the thraldom of sin to resolve in his heart, I don't want this anymore, and I'm giving it up. Whatever it takes, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to obey Christ and all he requires. And upon a confession of that trust, that faith, that confidence in Christ, he's now qualified by the Lord to be immersed in water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the remission of sins. He's changed states, you see. Before he was baptized, he was outside of Christ, outside of the kingdom. But he was baptized, or as Paul said, translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. He's a Christian now. Nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. No hyphenated Christian, just a Christian. Of Christ, in the church, that is of by and for Jesus Christ, the glory of God the Father, the salvation of his souls, and all other souls. How has he become a member of the church? The Lord added him to it when he was baptized for the remission of sin. That's the simple plan of salvation. If you've been studying with us, not only today, but in weeks before, and you see then, as we pull these cases of conversions together, and we do our best to delineate why it is that one must be baptized to be saved. It doesn't rule out confession of faith preceding baptism. It doesn't rule out repentance preceding confession of faith. And it certainly doesn't rule out belief preceding that repentance. And you know, you can't have any belief in Christ properly if you haven't had the evidence that produces it. And that's because you heard and applied the marvelous gospel of Jesus Christ to your life. If you need to obey the gospel, we urge you to do it this morning. As a child of God, if you've left the way, repent of those sins. Come confessing them and pray God for forgiveness. Whatever your need spiritually, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.